So midterm tomorrow, right? So we're going to do our usual going to the practice midterm. If you have any questions, you know the drill. Stop me. Raise your hand. All that kind of good stuff. Maybe you have a question before we start. Yes. I won't be here for the midterm tomorrow. Is that okay? No. Okay. Next question. <laughs> also, probably not a question you should ask. Don't you mean class. that the midterm is going to be Friday? Friday. Yes. Tomorrow. That's what I meant. <laughs> Sorry. Good, good question. <laughs> I just think in the classes in Monday, Wednesday, Friday, right? Uh, think about you guys so much, you're just the next day to me. Thanks, <laughs> man. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Sorry, I don't know if Mary asked. Are you going to be giving us first pause test on the, on the regular test also? Maybe, maybe not. It's a problem. Okay. You, need to, you should be super familiar with how to do first and follow tests, right? Consider the grammar with the following first and follow sets, right? So here's our grammar. We have the first sets, S, B, C, and D, and we have the follow sets. Okay, so the first question asks, prove that the grammar supports a predictive parser. So what are the rules? So what are the rules that a grammar can support a predictive parser? Yeah, so if we have some rule like A goes to alpha and another rule A goes to beta, <coughs> right, where a, alpha and beta are a whole right hand side of any number of symbols, then it must be the case that the first of alpha is not equal to the <coughs> first or has no intersection with, right? The intersection of the first of alpha with the first of beta gives us the empty set. So what's the second rule? The rules first and follow must be disjoint. Uh, in what case? First and epsilon. Yeah, so if there's a epsilon, those are different, right? Yeah. Uh, if epsilon is in the first of alpha, right? So if the right hand side can go to epsilon, then it must be the case that the first and follow of the right hand side are just disjoint, right? So first of alpha uh, intersect with follow of alpha is the empty set, right? Or no, follow of a, right? yeah, follow of a. Okay, so can you write this? Did I prove anything here? Not really. What did I do? Just the rules. I just wrote down rules. Right? So if you did this on a test, I don't know, how many points did you expect to get? Maybe like a quarter? Maybe? I don't know. People did this. This is why I'm making this point. Right? This is not a proof. Right? You actually have to actually show, okay, in this example, how do these rules hold? For instance, uh, just for space reasons, I'm going to do this, get rid of this. Uh, but we have our rules. So here we have B goes to CD. And B goes to little b, big D, little b, right? So it must be the case that the first of C, D, right? So what's the first of C, D? C, D, epsilon. C, and then D, epsilon, yes. C, D, epsilon. And the first of, I'm just going to do capital F for this, uh, little b, big D, little d. What's that? little b, and we can see that the intersection of those is equal to the empty set, right? That's good. Okay, we have this, and we're going to check these two. So we're going to check the first of little c, big c, which is little c, little c. and then intersect that with the first of, of, of what's the first of epsilon? Epsilon. Epsilon, yes. Hopefully it should be a trick question. I think I have not that one here. All right, so the intersection of these two sets is the empty set. And finally, we have D big D. The first of this is little d. Intersect that with the first of epsilon. And finally, we, which is the second containing epsilon. 
and then we get that that is the empty set. So I showed, this is showing that the first rule holds for this grammar, right? So if this were a test, I'd probably write out all the firsts here. But in the order of time, right? So this shows that that first part works. So then the second part is if we have a right hand side that goes to epsilon, then it must be the case that the first of that right hand side is not intersect with the follow of the left hand side, right? That's what that rule says. So let's think. Let's think about which of these can go to epsilon. So can B little e go to epsilon? What's this first set? Is it epsilon? Um, in, in that example, um, the first one we did first of C, D, mm -hmm. but it's C, D, and epsilon. Isn't it just C and epsilon? Because you, do you, don't you only look at the first non-terminal, the C? Do you include, include the first? Well, how do you calculate the first set of a series like this? I thought you just looked at the first non-terminal, but I guess I'm Oh, well, you do look at the first non-terminal, right? Or you look at the first symbol, right? right? You say, just like calculating any kind of first set, right? You say, take the first set of the leftmost symbol, which is C epsilon. You subtract epsilon from it, you oh, add it to the right. first set. And then you go to the next one because there's epsilon in it, right? So you add uh, D minus E minus epsilon from that to add little d. And then you say, did I make it all the way through? Yes, I made it all the way through. Um, so I have to add epsilon. You can think of it as, uh, let's say we added some new rule E here for whatever reason, some new non-terminal, and we said E goes to C, D, right? And so the first of C, D is the same as the first of E. Right, so you know how to calculate this, so you know how to calculate this. This is the exact same thing, so it's just like making it a rule that exists only in one place for those two things. Cool, good question. Okay, so then going back to here, so applying that here, so then what's the first of this big B, little e? C, D, B, right? Subtract epsilon from it. And then I say, is there an epsilon in this symbol? Yes, go on to the next symbol. The next symbol is a little e. What's the first set of little e? E. And then, uh, are there epsilons in all of these symbols? No. no. So then I'm done. All right, so there's no epsilon here. Uh, is there an epsilon in the first of CD? Yes. Yes. So I'm going to underline that, right? We have to worry about that. Is there an epsilon in this rule? No. Nope. Nope. Yeah. So do you actually have to do that? I mean, that work right there. Can't you just look at the right side? And here? Get, yeah, is there an epsilon in the first set? And go to the bottom side? Because isn't that what we already Yes, well, but you need to look at them in because it's the whole right-hand side rule, right? So, for instance, uh, I mean, just looking at this, right, if you looked at S goes to B little E, you'd say, oh, there's an epsilon here, so I have to worry about this, right? But this right-hand side is never going to go to epsilon. That's why I'm saying you look at the first of S, and you see there's no epsilon in the first of S. Ah, ah, yes, yes. So you do need that, but you need to know which rule it came from, right? Because that's what you want to find out. Like, is epsilon coming from this rule or this rule? Okay. So that's basically what I'm doing here. But yeah, you can narrow it down further by saying, like, okay, look, so only I'm only going to look at the left-hand side of B, C, and D because there's epsilons in here. And then I'm figuring out which rule to apply. Uh, so can this ever produce epsilon? Nope. Nope. Uh, C, little c? Nope. This? Yep. 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 This? Nope. nope. This? Yes. Okay. So I need to show that the first of CD intersects with what? How do I apply that rule? Follow of who? Of B, yeah. So follow of B, so this needs to be equal to null for this to be true, for the empty set, sorry. Uh, so the first of CD, which we just calculated up here, is C D epsilon intersect that with the follow of B. So we have the follow of B here, which is E. 
So is there any intersection here? No. Nope. So that's the empty set, that's good. And we check here, we check, uh, we're gonna check the first of epsilon uh, union with, well, I'm gonna write it out here to save space. Uh, the first of epsilon, which is the second term <coughs> epsilon, we're going to intersect that with the follow of what? I'm doing the second rule. C. Follow C. And this we know is going to work, right? Uh, because there's not going to be any epsilons in follow sets. But we can do it mechanically, and we can look, and we can see that empty set. OK, then we'll look at the next rule. Epsilon, which is equal to the second thing, epsilon, intersect that <coughs> with follow of D, which is going to be DV, and this intersection <coughs> is the empty set. So this, now, yeah. So uh, this question is asking to prove that the parameter supports a predictive parser. And in yes. the homework, you were asking us why the grammar. This is how you show that it supports a predictive parser. I actually don't I need to memorize all the homework questions. Uh, yeah, well this is explain explain why this grammar okay. or prove that the grammar supports their two sides of the same coin. Okay. okay. Any questions on that? Yeah. Can you can, sorry, but can you explain again why you compare F the first of epsilon? Here? Yeah. <coughs> so I'm applying, so these are the two different rules, right? So this right. first rule is all about saying that like, basically in English it says, if I have a given non-term on the left-hand side, I know always know which rule to choose by looking at the first character. Right. right. So it says deciding between these two rules, I can tell by looking at the first character which rule it is. The next rule says, if a rule goes to epsilon, like C, D, right? Both C and D can go to epsilon. So if that goes to nothing, then I need to distinguish between if it went to something versus the case where it went to nothing, so what came after me? Right, so uh, if CD went to epsilon, and I, so if I read just one character, how do I know that character came from either C or D or came from whatever came after B because B went to epsilon? Okay, so the first, the first part only applies no, no, this applies to everything. Oh. It's every single rule. Wherever you have a, a <coughs> choice between rules. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So for the second rule, then, couldn't you just look through all of the first sets and just see which of those have epsilon in them and just do the intersect operation with their respective follow sets? Uh, no, because you need to know the exact rule. You've already proven that the rules are disjoint, right? So here I know that CD is disjoint from B, big B, little d. But, um, so I know there's not going to be epsilon in either of them, so you need to find out which specific rule is going to give you epsilon. I see. Because it doesn't matter what this guy produces, because we already know this is uh, always going to have a big D, and we can tell which one because of that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I think you get the same answers either way, but on your slides and on the homework solution, it said first of A, intersection follow of A. Yeah, I didn't need a specific one. Uh, okay, that makes more sense. Yeah. Okay, like first of B here? Yeah. Yeah, okay, that makes much more sense. Okay, then you, good question. So then do you still have to see which of the two rules? No, then in that case you don't. Okay. Yeah, then that's a lot easier. Okay, sorry, that was... Yeah, it was, it's been working, so. Yeah, so it's, if you think about it, it's going to be larger, right? So first of B is going to contain the first of C, D, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, that's good. So it's going to have a B in here. That's good. All right, first of C, yeah, so C 
see is C epsilon. function of a predictive recursive descent parser for the grammar. Print out the rule after successfully parsing the rule, as in the homework. You can assume you have functions get token, unget token, and syntax error. Uh, you can assume that you also have parse function for all the non-terminals, all the other non-terminals, right? <coughs> so the first thing we know, right, is we can know that we're going to parse B. First thing we do is what? Yeah, we need to get a token, right? So I'm gonna use T type. Okay, then what do I check? What was that? First of CD. First of CD. First of CD. Yeah, so I need to check which rule is this, right? So I need to say, is this token in first of CD, right? And I know first of CD is C, D, and epsilon. So I do, but can I check for epsilon? No, no right? It's not going to give me, it's a token, right? It just read something from input. It can't read nothing from input. It's either going to give me a token or give me the end of file, right? So I'll say if uh, T type is equal to C, or T type is D, right? So I've just read these tokens. Uh, then what do, I, what do I definitely know about this? Uh, it should be T, right? Yeah, C and D. Um, so in your homework, yes. Um, at least in the solutions, I'm pretty sure you also have to add in the follow of B. Ah, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, you could do it either way. I kind of like to do it as a separate clause so that it's clear. Okay, so I thought it was. Um, that's why I do it, but I thought it was wrong. No, it's not wrong. Um, I'd say you could do it both ways, right? It kind of, I guess from an engineering perspective, it's better to do it all at once. That way you don't have to repeat everything that's in here. Um, so yeah, let's do that. So, okay, so why do we, why do we do that? So why do we check the follow of B here? Right, because the first of CD contains epsilon, right? <coughs> and so if this goes to epsilon, then we know it must be in the follow of B, right? So if it's not an E, then it's going to eventually be a syntax error, right? <coughs> so let's do that. Or... don't know that we've successfully parsed a B goes to CD, right? We know we've chosen this rule. It should be this rule, but we have to parse a C and then parse a D to know that we've successfully completed this rule, right? So we need to call an unget token, right, to put the token back because we just peaked that token, right? So we have to put it back, and then we want to call parse C, and then parse D, right? So that once these two functions return, right, if there's a syntax error in either one of those, they'll call syntax error and parsing will terminate. So we know if they return, 
we've successfully parsed a C and then a D, which means that we've successfully, right, we've successfully parsed uh, B goes to CD. Okay. Now we need to check. Big D, little B. E. Just a little B, right? So else, uh, oh, this is a Python else, sorry. Uh, else if T type is equal to little B, right? Then do I unget token? Why do I not unget token? Right, it's a terminal, right? We just, we consumed that B, which is perfect. Now we successfully consumed that, so now we need to call what? Parse B, uh, parse D, parse big D, right? We want to call parse D again, or not again, but we want to call parse D, right? That's going to go parse a D. And then what are we going to do? Do we say yes, we've done this correctly? No. Yeah, remember this was B, D, B, right? So we need to call get token again to check, hey, the next token better be a B, otherwise we have problems. So we call, uh, Type is equal to get token. And then we're going to call me running out of room. Uh, T type is get token. And then we call, uh, so if, uh, yeah, so if T type, right, does not equal to a B. Then what? Yeah, I'm going to write that here. Right, definitely syntax error. And then we close this up. So now what do we know? We parse this completely. So now we print because we know we've, uh, we've parsed this successfully. So we print out uh, B goes to little b, big d, little b. Bless you. Uh, done with this. And then what if it's neither of these things? Syntax error, right? That's it, right? Cool, questions on this? Sweet. I think in the homework, yeah. the homework he actually had a main. We actually need to write, write out main. What? Oh, write a main function? No. You only have to do whatever it tells you to do, right? So here, uh, all you have to do is the parse of the E function. Yeah. And we're not storing the, the, the B, the little b at all? Storing? Like, do we need to store it at all? Or? Where are you going to store it? I don't know. I mean. Yeah, so I mean, that's this is more of like kind of abstract parsing in a sense, right? Uh, yes, like in project four, Right, when we do the parsing, we're actually building data structures that represent the parse tree. Here, we're not really doing that. We're just outputting which rules occurred. Right? But you can easily, once you have the structure, you can easily add in. So here, I would uh, create some structure that represented B, big D, little b. Question. Is that the same, though, for the last problem of the homework with the circle box diagrams? Because you had all of them, but the question only asked for P and Q. Yes. Yeah, you'll, you'll be asked, um, you know, to, yeah, so I gave more in the solution there just to show what it looks like, but like, as we see on here, I think in here I asked for almost everything, so, yeah, you just have to read and understand what the question's asking you, right? All right. All right, then we do the parse C function. Let's, let's see, is C interesting? I don't think C is any more interesting than B. I actually think B is more interesting. So let's uh, let's leave it for now, and then we'll come back to it if we have time. That way we can make sure we get through all the problems. Okay. Problem two. Consider the following code in C syntax. Okay. So here we have a piece of C code, and then we need to. 
put the output of this program assuming that we use static scoping and the output of the program assuming we use dynamic scoping. So just from looking at this problem, what can you tell about these two answers? They should probably be different, right? I mean, so if you do something and they come out the same, you should probably double check, right? To see if something went wrong. I mean, that would be a very tricky question if they did come out exactly the same, but for different reasons or something. But anyways, this is our test taking tip, right? You gotta meta think about the test. Okay. So let's do this statically, right? This should be pretty easy. We just put it in our compiler. Just kidding. Okay. Sorry. Bad joke. All right. All right. So we can easily, one way to do this, right, is to just resolve uh, the references. You can either do it beforehand or as you're simulating execution. Uh, I think beforehand is kind of easy, right? We can just map every instance statically to a declaration, right? So we know what everything refers to. So I know that refers to here, this refers to here. Uh, where does this J refer to? This one? Yeah, up here, right? Uh, then that J refers to global J. Also, if you're taking a test, right, would I probably have you print out an uninitialized variable? Probably not, because what would you output, right? So, mm, it's not correct, though. <laughs> so does your computer print out undefined? Did you print out an undefined variable? No. No, yeah. So I would probably not make you do that, right? So you want to think about what's, you know, if you got to a point where you're printing out J and you're like, huh, J is nothing, it hasn't been assigned to, you're probably doing something wrong. Okay, so let's go to this execution. So I'm going to put here, the value, so I have only three declarations, right? So I'm going to put here the value of each of these. Bless you. Okay. J is equal to one. I already decided this J is this J up here, so I know inside here is going to be one. Right? This has the value one. So I'm going to call pop. Uh, pop is up here. And I'm going to say, is J less than four? Yes. Yes. J is less than four, so increment J. So what's the value of J now? Two, all right, two, and then I'm gonna print out J. So the first thing I'm gonna print out is two. This pop returns, I return here, I call Baz. Baz sets this J equal to zero. Then inside here, this J is set to five. And then we call pop again. Pop says, is J less than four? <coughs> yes, it's two, so we increment J. Three. And then we're going to print out J, so we're going to print out 3. Uh, we return <coughs> from pop, which is here. Then we print out J, so which J is this going to print out? The, the 0, yeah, remember? All right, so that's the scoping question, right? All right, sorry. Got me all tripped up. OK, that prints out 5. Then we call pop again. Pop is going to go in here. Is J less than 4? Yes. 3 is less than 4, so increment it. So print out 4. Pop, a bad is going to return. We call pop one more time. Is 4 less than 4? No, no. no, so we print out what? 4. four. Cool. Questions on that? How does this change when we, in general, right? What's our strategy now that we're talking about dynamic scoping? What are we going to build as we do the execution? Yeah, the symbol table, right? We're going to manually build the symbol table as we're executing this function, uh, this program. So here in the global scope, right, our very first thing we're going to have is a variable named J. Right, it has a name J, no value yet. We get into main. Main doesn't have any local variables, so we're not going to create a new scope in our table for there. And it's going to set J is equal to one. So this reference, how do we resolve this reference dynamic with dynamic scoping? So the most recent yeah. J, 
Exactly. We look up our table and we see the first thing we see that's defined as <coughs> J. Right? So we set it one. one in here. Then we call pop. So pop goes. Then it looks up J. Is this, so first you have to resolve the J, right? Is this J less than 4? Yes. yes. Then we increment J. So this J is going to be 2. Then we're going to print out J. So it's going to print out And then pop will return. Then we call baz. So inside baz, we have a new local variable called j, right? So I'm going to draw this for kind of the new scope. Oop, that's a terrible line. So much better. All right. And then I set this j equal to 0. Then I enter a new scope here, right? A new block that has another local variable called j. So I do the same thing, right? I just create a new scope called J. And I set this J to be 5, right? So we're looking bottom up. So it's going to set this to be 5. Then we're going to call pop. And so then pop's going to say, which J is this going to test? The 5. Yeah, so 5 less than 4? No. Oh, easy question, right? <coughs> so we print out 5. So this pop returns, and then what happens when we leave this scope? What happens to our table when we leave this scope right before here? Yeah, this one leaves our scope, right? We can no longer reference that. It's gone. It leaves our simple table. Now when we print out J, this is going to look up which J. Okay, it's going to print out 0. And then it's going to call pop. So is 0 less than 4? Yes. So we increment it. So we print out what? 1. Uh, pop returns from here. Pop returns from Baz. So what happens when we leave this scope? Yes. Right. That's the really important thing that we have to remember to do when we're doing dynamic scoping, right? We have to make sure when we leave scopes, right, <coughs> these, uh, the variables in that scope are automatically deallocated. So then we get back into main, we call pop. Pop is 2 less than 4. So we increment that, and we're going to print out 3. Questions on that? What should you do? Blah, blah, blah. What should you double check while you're doing this? What What are you most likely to mess up on here? Deleting the simple table. Definitely that in dynamic scoping, but actually in general, you're, it can be very easy to flip this around or mistake it, right? Or try to I don't know calculate in your head and get it wrong or something, right? So uh, you know. Take your time, double check, three less than four, right? All right. So what's the answer to this one? Your bet's going. <coughs> Isn't it fun? Look at how many pointers we have. It's a perf the perfect, <laughs> perfectly right amount of pointers. Okay. It's such a short program, too, right? All right. So we have uh, local variables P, Q, W, and X. How do these are the same? That's weird. Oh, whatever. They're memory locations, right? So uh, even though these are technically the same symbol, it actually doesn't matter, right? Because we know addresses are different from variable names. Right? Names are bound to locations. Uh, locations have addresses. So we're just using symbolic uh, variables here. Uh, just like here when we use memory one and two. So we have Q is being malloced. Uh, we have W is being malloced. And we set S e X equal to the character X. We set P equal to the address of Q. Uh, 
Uh, we then basically draw the box circle diagrams at point at this point right here, and then we uh, then we dereference p and set that equal to the address of w, and then we triple dereference p and set that equal to x. Uh, then we set x equal to the character p, and then we output the circle box diagrams again. So a question on what this program does. Okay. So let's get drawing. We didn't know you draw so much in this class, did we? Let's see, how do I want to do this? Just do it here. Okay. So we have our local variables, right? We how many local variables do we have? So these are local variables, which means they're going to be bound uh, to their boxes, right? So we have our variable name. It's bound to a location. Uninitialized pointers all equal are equal to null. So what's inside the x? Garbage. We don't know. Yeah, garbage. We'll call it garbage for now. But uh, so we know when we start. I'm going to use a capital N for null because I didn't give myself a wide enough circle. And then the x is something, but we don't know. Okay. So. We've done all this, right? We've done all, we've created all the box for there. So now we have this line. So we're calling malloc. So what, is, what do we know malloc does? Creates a new box. Yeah, well, this is a really big box. All right, what's the address of that box? Mem1, right? Well, I guess we didn't draw it, but we should put, so the address of P is W, the address of Q is X, uh, the address of W is Y, and the address of X is Z. Okay. So then, what does this malloc do? So what does this malloc return? An address. An address, right? What specifically what address? One in this case. Yeah, one in this case. And then, so where, what are we doing with one? Yeah, we're copying that. It's an L value to an R value, right? L value equals R value. So we're taking that value, that R value, copying it in the location associated with that L value. Or the value in the location associated with that L value. So we're going to copy one, and we're going to put it inside Q. Then we're going to have the next malloc. going to be memory 2, and so what's going to happen after this malloc? Yeah, 2 is going to be in the location value of the location that's bound to W, right? So we're going to put that in here. And then we're going to set x equal to the character x, right? So this is, again, L value is equal to R value, so we're going to put just x here. And then we do p is equal to the address of q. Uh, so what's the address of q? X. X, right? It's just the address. It's an r value. So we're setting an l value to an r value. So we're going to do what with x? With this address x. Yeah. Copy it into the value of the location associated with p. So this is going to put x in here. So then I go back to the question, right? So I've drawn box circle diagrams for P, Q, W, and X. Uh, I also need to draw and label star P, star Q, and star W. Right. So where? what's star P? It points to like uh, like this? 
Yes, the box. Right? <coughs> All right, uh, so I did this. Now I need to do star q. So what does star q point to? The box at memory address one. The box at memory address one, yeah. So. And then star w? Same deal, but it's memory address 2. All right, good. Sweet. All right, since we're here, we're just going to keep going. All right, so I'm going to keep using this. A snapshot this. This is uh, point 0.1. Box circle diagrams. No, I lost my box. Okay, so let's keep going. So let me say uh, star p is equal to the address of w. Right. So what's the address of w? Y. Y. And so the address of w is an R value. Right, of y, and, and then star p is going to return what? An l value or an r value? L, l value, yeah, it better be an l value because it's on the left-hand side of an, equal, uh, of an assignment statement, right? So star p, so we already said star p points to what? Q, yeah? So then what am I doing here? So I'm going to take y, and where am I putting y, copying y? Where the y is. <laughs> Where the one is, yeah, inside the circle. Right? So take this R value, Y, copy it in the location associated with star P. So star P points to this box right here, so I'm going to copy Y and put it in that box. Yes? Just a quick hypothetical question. Um, if it was star P and ampersand, like, is there a way to make it so you can change the address with the pointer? This? No. No? No. Way. no. Okay. no. no the locations and the addresses associated with them are fixed, right, in memory. Okay. Yeah, this is why you can't do, so this is why address of operator returns an R value, right? So you oh, can't okay. say the address of P is equal to 10, right? Right. There's, yeah. there's no way to, to do that. We did this. Now we have to do star 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 p equals x. So which is more difficult to think about? Star star star. Thank you. Star 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 p, right? X is this, right? We know what x is. So we have an l. So we know that star returns an l value. Right? So we know star 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 p is going to return an l value. So we have an l value is equal to l value, so we know how to handle that. Right? We're going to just take whatever's inside <coughs> x, which is this character x, and we're going to copy it somewhere. Right? But the question is, where do we copy it? So what's star p? The location associated with q. Yeah, it's this box. right? So this is star p, and then, uh, so then we dereference this again. Yeah, the box associated with W that has the address Y, so it's this box. And then we dereference that. This one, right? And so where are we going to copy the character X? Right here. Cool. Then I say X is equal to the character P. Oh, yeah. Question. I mean, I'm not intentionally. <laughs> okay, then we say x is equal to p. Or what, is, where, what are we doing with p? Right, copying it into the location associated with x, right? All right, so this has us do this, p, q, w, x, and all the, the dereferences. So x. The x inside p points to the location that is at address x, 
right? So this is star P. Star Q is uh, dereference Y, or point to the box that, that the location, uh, that's at address, the location that that address Y. So we have here star Q. And then here we have uh, star W. <coughs> make this harder. What are the all of the aliases in this program? So what's an alias? Two names that have the same location. Yeah, two or more names that have the same. Any aliases are two or more names for things that have the same location, right? Starting from our variables. Right? So P is associated with this location. Is there any other way to reference this location P? No, there's no way, right? Starting from any of those other variables, there's no possible way to get there. What about Q, this box? Yeah, Q and star P, so. How do you write aliases? Sorry. Q and star P, right? Okay, this is one set of aliases. Uh, what about W here? Yeah, so W is a name for this, right? And we can go backwards, we can see that star Q is a name for this. What else? Star star, 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 P. star, star P. Right, what about X? Are there any other aliases for X? No, there were at one point though, right? But that changed because of the way the program executed. So then what about this location? Junk, garbage. Yeah, it's garbage, right? We actually have no way to reference this. So there's no, not even a single alias. I mean, not even a name for this one, right? Which is why it's garbage. We cannot reference it. What about this box? Yeah, so we can get there with star W, right? Star, star Q. Triple star. <laughs> See, is that it? Yeah, I think that's, I mean, this is all the boxes, right? So. Cool. This was even an easier question, because I only had to do just two of these. Any other questions on this one? Do we have any other questions? Yes, okay, cool. This is a good one. Okay. Okay, consider the, calling C, uh, consider the following code in C syntax and assume stack memory allocation for nested scopes. Nested scopes are used, is used. Recall that a dangling reference is a reference to memory address that was originally allocated but is now deallocated. And garbage memory is memory that has been allocated on the heap but has not been explicitly deallocated, yet is not accessible uh, by the program. So here we have a code. And it's asking us the memory locations that are garbage, <coughs> memory locations at points one and two, dangling references at points one and two, and memory locations that are deallocated at location two. So what should we use to do this? Box or whole diagram. Okay. So we have a box for X. That looks weird if you don't capitalize. main we have A we have A and C All right, there's a C and then finally inside this scope we have B First line, we malloc, we're mallocing a new memory, and we're setting it equal to A. So we're copying, so we have a new memory location, 
at address 1 with nothing in it yet, and we're copying that 1 into A. So A now points to 1. Then B, we are uh, doing the same thing. So we're creating a new memory location, calling it 2, and setting copying 2, the R value there, into B. Now we're setting C is equal to the address of B. So what's the address of B? Address of B, right? So we're going to put that into C. Then we're going to allocate a new chunk of memory called memory 3. And we're going to copy that into B. And then we're going to set B equals A. So what's that's going to, what is that going to do? Copy one into B. A equals B, sorry. You're going off my words, not what I wrote. Yes, that's good. Copy three into A, right? So it's going to change this <coughs> to three. Uh, C, X equals C. So we're going to uh, take the address of, P, of B and copy it into X. Then we are taking the address of A and copying it into W. So the address of A is here, copying that into W. All right, now we're at location one. So we can answer the questions at location one. So the memory addresses that are garbage at location one. So from here, maybe it'll help to draw the graph, right? From here we can get to here. Uh, with the D reference, the address of B means we can get here. Uh, 3 means we can get all the way here. Address of A means that we can get here. And the address of B means that we can get here. Right? So yeah, there's no way we can access 1 or 2. <coughs> right, so 1 and 2 are garbage. Uh, dangling references at location 1. Are any of these pointers pointing to something that does not exist? So what would you write here? None. none, because it told you in the question. You wouldn't ask, what do I write if none of them apply? So I'd have to tell you to look at the question. OK, then we free B. So what does freeing B do? Does it get rid of this box? No. Right. What does it do? It gets, what does it get rid of? Yeah, the value that's in, it looks up the thing that B points to, right? So it returns. It's going to free, it's going to look inside here, say, OK, what location has address 3? So it's this one. And it's going to say, OK, I'm going to deallocate this. We free B. And then what happens between there and here? We leave scope. We leave scope. Whose scope? So then what happens to the location associated with B? It goes away too, right? Automatically, because it's automatically deallocated. So, now we're at location two. So which memory addresses are garbage at location two? Still one and two. Dangling references at location two? Yes. So C points to something that no longer exists, right? And what about A? A as well, right? It points to 3. And what about X here? Yeah, so it would be X, A, and C, right? And if you draw the arrows, it's very clear. Yeah? So free of B got rid of the heap allocation and the stack allocation? No, free B got rid of memory address 3. And then why would we get rid of? <coughs> Because B is declared here in this scope, so it's automatically deallocated as we leave scope. Uh, what was it? X, A, and C? What about W? What about W? 
a W? Is W a dangling reference? Yeah, you can say star W is dangling, but W itself is not dangling, right? So dangling reference means you can't dereference it because it points to nothing. Okay, uh, what memory locations have been deallocated at location two? Memory address three. Three? And the address of B, right? Because of stack allocation, it's been automatically deallocated. So B is wrong, you have to put address B. I think I'd probably count it, but I would put address of B to be more precise. So you don't write W star? For four? You could do that. I would allow that for me. It's not wrong. Yeah? Can you explain why the dangling references aren't all pointers? I just don't understand why it's like X, or X star is the dangling reference, not just X. Uh, oh, <laughs> because dangling reference means uh, the address inside the pointer dangling, basically. Like <coughs> the address inside there. So uh, let's, let's maybe we go back to the. It's a reference to a memory address that was originally allocated but is now deallocated, right? So inside X, right, there is a memory address, but the problem is that memory address has been deallocated and no longer exists. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? I think y'all are pretty ready for the midterm on Friday, so. On Friday, not tomorrow. Don't come tomorrow. Yeah. 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 I feel like we're forced to start midterm exam questions, right. so. Yeah. Let's go ahead. Okay. okay, if you go down to like the end of part, yeah. right, <laughs> right there. Yeah. Oh, go down again, sorry, to the other else. Oh, I didn't, I erased Oh, you erased it, okay, never mind. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, you're fine, you're fine. Yeah, basically, I think like, if it's not here, it's a syntax error. Oh, okay. I you have doesn't equal b. Yes. Okay, I thought it was equal equal yes, b, sorry, so I thought they were reversed. All right. <laughs> or you could go not equal like this. Right. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Right. Because if it's successful, then we we only care we'll about the case out. where it's not exactly. Right. Then we then we're gonna continue successfully and just print everything out. Okay. Cool. Cool. Thanks. All right. <laughs> questions? Yes. Project questions. Okay. You uh, sound disappointed almost. Uh, I have, I have a question on the midterm. Go for it. I'm not. <laughs> um, so for the first problem, you know how you said if they have, if you have an option, like you have to compare the options, right? Yes. What if there's three options? You just compare them all at once, or you have to compare one, like <coughs> you have to compare them all to each other. Uh, the intersection of all of them. I mean, they're. Mm. You know what I mean, like. You just keep yes, you have to pairwise compare them. You have to compare everyone. <laughs> oh. Okay. So if you had three rules, you would. So then you two pair, must each pair, be distinct. You need yeah, to be able to pair. decide between them. So yeah, if you had like, I mean, if if we had like A goes to little A and A goes to little B and A goes to little C and A goes to D, right? Mm -hmm. You have to make sure that these are all completely distinct. So A B A C A D. Yeah. Yes. B C. B, yeah, because you can't do C, if wow. you tried to inter. If you tried to intersect, <coughs> if I intersect two of them and I get something, I don't want to intersect that with something else. Right. Because I want the fact that there is an overlap there. Oh. Would you give us something like that? Possibly. Please don't. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's the same as doing it three different times but, here, right? But so little time to write this much information. So little time. <laughs> yeah, like on the first test, it was not enough time. I didn't check any did really well, yeah. though. I know. But that was hard. We would have done better if we had more time. <laughs> yeah. I promise. <laughs> Okay. I concur. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, that was on that question. Okay. Too. Any other uh, midterm questions? Uh, I just did it. I went over it. <laughs> he means on the actual test. <coughs> <coughs> I was not answering. <laughs> cool. Okay, you have project questions? Uh, then I think I'm just going to answer them and not record it. I'll just add <laughs> those to the end. All right.